Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today. I think it's August 6, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am coming to you from my still not fully used to it set up in my basement. Um, I don't know if I can show you. Yes, I can. So here is a quick look at the basement from another view. Um, and right off screen is actually an art instro who is currently visiting and watching things live. If you stick your right arm out, your yeah. There, you can see his hand sneak in off the side of the camera. Now, um, I, I am trying really hard to, to figure out how to get this set up to work better. Um, this week is going to be our experiment week, and I am currently reminded one should not wear green while green screening. I apologize for the video stream of my twinkling shirt that is trying to be completely, um, well, part of the green screen. Mistakes were made, people. Mistakes were made. Um, one of those mistakes was you are currently seeing not the first slide of the day. Now you're seeing the first slide of the day. So this is a news show. I'm going to bring you the news instead of, well, in addition to the chaos. Now, today's top news story is one that amuses me far more than it probably should. Um, and this is one of when science goes splat. Back on April 11th, Israel's Space IL tried to land the Beresheet lander on the moon, but folks, space is hard. And the moon ate Beresheet. Um, they failed, but while the spacecraft was a total loss, there may still have been survivors. Um, it turns out the spacecraft was packing a population of tardigrades, extremely small extremophiles that generally refuse to die. These uh, small critters, nicknamed water bears, are roughly 0.4 millimeters in length, many-legged, and can live for years without food and water. This means there may be a population of thousands of tardigrades, thousands of water bears, for very small values of living, living on the moon. Now, I, don't get me wrong, these tardigrades aren't off partying in the lunar dust. They aren't setting up colonies. They aren't even reproducing or respirating. They are at this moment shut down um, in hibernation on the moon. On the moon. What do we do with this information? I'm not sure. I just know it's really cool. It also tells us that as we work on exploring worlds that are capable of sustaining life that just might choose to reproduce, something that's not going to happen on the moon, we need to sterilize not just the outside of our spacecraft, but also the inside of our spacecraft. Because space is hard and accidents happen. And um, you never know when you just might be seeding life on another world by literally crashing into it. So yeah, there are extremophiles on the moon. Okay, so today's next story is one of looking at dead things instead of living things. Um, as we talked about last week, when stars like our sun end their lives or reach middle age as the case may be, uh, they stop burning hydrogen in their core and they bloat up into red giant stars. During this phase of their existence, they consume some of their innermost worlds if they have them, and they blast the surface of their other worlds with a large amount of light. And that's not all. 
as these red giant stars continue their evolution, they eventually hit the point where they just exhale off their atmosphere. And that exhaled atmosphere further blasts those worlds. Now the question is, can those worlds, or at least some part of them, survive irradiation, getting blasted with a planet's atmo uh, getting blasted with a star's atmosphere as it becomes a planetary nebula, and all the other things that happen? And the answer may be yes. And in a new uh, study coming to us um, from Penn State University, scientists have modeled just what might just what might happen to planets in a solar system around sun-like stars that decide to end their lives as white dwarfs. And what they realized is these planets, or at least the cores of what's left of these planets, are going to be extremely hot and in radio waves just might be visible for like a billion years. So it turns out that even after a star has died, we might be able to figure out if it once had a solar system of worlds around it. Now, this raises the question, what do we do with this information? And the answer is we might finally be able to solve just when did planets start forming in our universe? As we look around, well, stars like our sun that were born a long time ago, they're not around being stars like our sun anymore. They have died and become white dwarfs. And it turns out, if we look at the areas around these white dwarfs in the right shades of radio light, we may be able to find these fossils of solar systems. And um, that might finally start to tell us, are we one of the first solar systems to form? Or are we a later generation in a universe that's already had generation upon generation of planets being born, living, and getting blasted very, very dead by their parent star? Now, in other news of the white dwarf variety, um, it turns out white dwarfs play a whole lot of roles in astronomy, and one of their major roles is as we think maybe, kind of, as a standard candle. It is thought that when a white dwarf star by hook or by crook somehow ends up hitting a specific critical amount of mass, it explodes as a type 1a supernova. And it is thought, maybe, that all type 1a supernova are coming from white dwarfs that have the same amount of mass and thus, when they explode, give off the same amount of light. Now, there's always been scientists out there disputing this. There's always been people saying, no, 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 no. The first generation of stars had a completely different composition. That means that those white dwarfs function differently and white dwarfs aren't all exploding at the same mass. And we just don't know. And the majority of people want to believe, hope that it's true, that the reality is white dwarfs generally explode. And I lost my mouse. I'm so sorry, people. You're going to have to see me for a moment trying to figure out where it went. There we go. OK. Um, it's, it's been thought for a long time that, that these stars were all exploding at the same time. But there's always been research disputing that. And in a new paper that comes out in the Astrophysical Journal and is led by Caltech's Evan Kirby, they go through and they describe both observations and theoretical models that point to it just might be possible for white dwarfs with a wide variety of metallicities to explode with a wide variety of masses. Now, this work, being a tangle of observations and theoretical models, seems to be onto something. And whenever you see Caltech scientists, you think, maybe I need to sit up and pay more attention to this. And the entire thing is fairly convincing. But that doesn't mean it's true. 
and science is a process. And one of the things that gives me pause when I read research results like this is when we look at the current plot of luminosity versus distance for supernova, we get a really nice line that doesn't have a whole lot of noise in the line. And as we talked about, I think it was yesterday or last week, it wasn't yesterday, it was last week. As we talked about last week, stars with a variety of different compositions have been forming all across time. There are still clouds of gas out there that don't have a lot of heavy metals, that haven't been enriched by a lot of supernovae. And this means that we're still in some places in our universe forming metal poor stars. We are forming extremely metal rich stars and everything in between. And this means that there are white dwarfs with a variety of metallicities across time with everything starting out with the same lack of stuff and over time adding more and more stuff and increasing the diversity. And so what I would have naively expected is if white dwarf stars explode with a variety of different masses and a variety of different luminosities, we'd get a different scatter in our observations than what we currently see as we work to standardize our measurements in different galaxies. And since we're not seeing that scatter, I don't know what to believe. And I'm really hoping that someone out there will do a review of all of the current observations, all of the current theories, all of the different ways that we measure noise and have standardized these white dwarfs to try and constrain, well, how much noise is allowed if we have a diversity of metallicities over time. And until that work is done, we can't really know what is true. And that is a fascinating and frustrating place to be, especially right now, where there is so much confusion in the expansion rate of our universe as a function of time. So this is a cool paper, but it's, it's a start. For now, we're just gonna have to settle for saying, maybe type 1a supernova are maybe all exploding with the same light. And maybe they make good standard candles. And maybe not. It's a process, people. It's a process. And that's all I've got for science today. And I will now, on my handy dandy phone, um, take your questions. Oh no, chat chat went away. I lost my entire chat history by not type looking at my phone. Um, our intro. Can you relay me questions from the chat history? Oh, yes. I have a human who can help. And we do have an Eddie down here today. He's completely asleep off camera. And we have a family-sized box of Cheerios. So while our intro is looking up those questions, I'm going to remind you all, this is The Daily Space. We come to you most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. That is 6 p.m. London time. And um, we are brought to you by you. We are a production of the Planetary Science Institute, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that means that when you donate, when you give bits, when you are our Patreon, patron over on patreon.com slash x your donations are tax deductible where the laws allow so thank you for all you do and we like to thank you with cuteness so if there are bits there just might be um cheerios going to the very very sleepy dog the very very sleepy dog um Okay, so do we have questions? A uh, couple of comments to start with. Terry okay. Swerver says we colonized the moon before Mars. Yes. And Rio B says people get all enraged on Twitter about this apparently. 
<laughs> yeah, Twitter is where people go with high emotions. Uh, DPI 209, did SpaceIL know that the ARC Mission Foundation added a biological payload? Um, I assume they did. I th I'm pretty sure everyone would have had to register their manifest. Uh, but taking a, a thousand tardigrades to the moon, um, we've already taken tardigrades to the moon on the outsides of our spacecraft. Uh, so there, there's two things. One, because the moon is presumed to be a dead world, it actually doesn't have planetary protections on it we can take life there and dump it. We have already thrown ashes of many different people at the surface of the moon. Um, so planetary protection rules weren't in place. And Beresheet was taking a variety of different symbols of humanity to leave on the moon. It had um, a lot of micro images of books. It had artwork. Uh, so this was just part of the time capsule we were leaving there. It was just a time capsule that happened to include life. Uh, Annie also asks um, regarding the type 1A supernovae, uh, couldn't you tell the metallicity of those stars from the light they give off? We can. So, so we can tell what the metallicity of each supernova is. What we can't tell is what is the absolute brightness of each of these systems unless they're very close and we can use uh, Cepheid variables, we can use any of a variety of other things and I'm going to switch cameras so that you can see the bits that are about to happen. Um, there, there's a whole variety of different things. So there is a eddy you can see just on the edge of the camera eating Cheerios off of the cardboard on the floor. Thank you, Chucker Kev. Thank you, Chucker Kev, for the bits. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Annie also asked, would this really change the size or age of our universe by a practical amount? And what would the change be? It, it depends on what you consider a practical amount to be. Uh, right now we're looking at the age of the universe is somewhere between 13 and a half and 14 and a half billion years. So it's not really a significant change, but it's enough that it might help us better understand expansion rates. Um, right now we're just in a state of confusion with the age of our universe. There's more bits, there's more bits. Thank you, Fen Mill. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I don't see a whole lot of other questions. Okay. Well, if today is a low question day, that's okay. Um, we will be back tomorrow with more news, and there are one if not more rocket launches later today that will be brought to you by somebody I'm not sure yet who we're gonna figure that out and I will simply say thank you and I will see if I can get my dog to come over and be on camera with me and be as exceedingly cute as he can possibly be um, whoa that did not go as planned let's see come on ah it ate my setup. Let me see if I can reinstate my setup. This is a weird bug that I'm hoping the update. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, hopefully the chat will come back as well. There's the chat. Okay. So come here, Eddie. Come be on camera with me. Uh, no, our Insta is the one with the bits. I, I am not to have any attention paid to. Um, Michael Meyer does have another question. Okay. Uh, does the variability of supernovae affect dark energy? So, so does the variability of type 1A supernovae is a standard candle affect our understanding of dark energy? Yes, but it doesn't make dark energy go away. It simply 
changes what is the acceleration we're potentially looking at of the acceleration. Um, so as near as we can tell from multiple different means, dark energy is a thing, people. It is a thing. I can't tell you if it's a force, if it's a pressure, if it's a quiescent field. I can't tell you that. I can just tell you it's a thing. Any more questions? Okay. So Skylius is currently streaming, so I think we're going to give her a raid today in Binary Blaze. If you're out there and you can raid from where you are, that would be awesome because um, I have once again forgot to carry my keyboard across the room. Um, so as always, this is The Daily Space. I am today's host, Dr. Pamela Gay. Tomorrow is Wednesday, which means it's Rocket Day, and Annie Wilson, Binary Blaze, will be here to bring you all that is new in spacecraft and liftoffs and landings and things like that, and probably even an update on the number of toilets currently on orbit. Um, besides that, we're here for you. There's more bits I think I heard. No? I delusionally heard bits. I hallucinated the sound of bits. Um, so we are a production of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3, and we are here thanks to you. If you can't afford to make a monetary donation, that's okay. What we also need is your help doing science. We are in the process of finishing up the mapping of the potential landing sites for the spacecraft OSIRIS-REx on the asteroid Bennu. And um, I am gearing up to be able to email the folks that happen to map those places that it turns out are safe and scientifically interesting. So if you want to potentially be someone I get to email saying you found a landing site, you have to go map on Bennu.CosmoQuest.org. So go map. Map people, hate map the rocks, measure those boulders, find those elusive craters. We can only do this with you. And there are more bits, so I shall share the happy dog happily eating the bits. Wow, my shirt is green screened. Um, thank you, everyone. Okay, so that's all I've got for now. Um, Wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. I'm going to try and guess which window in the background is Streamlabs. Ooh, I guessed correctly. I'm going to try and roll the credits. It says the credits are rolling. They are. So wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And remember, Get outside and look up. I'll see you all on the other side. <laughs> bye bye. So, launch coverage for the Ariane 5 will be in an hour. Okay. <laughs> there will be on the stream in an hour. Ooh.